Welcome, and thank you for joining us on Colin for our new show, Unruly, with Ryan and Rob. This is your co-host, Ryan Knight, and I'm excited to be joined by our other co-host, Rob Bermudez. Hello, everyone. And we're also joined by uh, our friend, Indy, who is the founder of Independent Left News. Indy, welcome uh, to Unruly. Thank, thanks, Ryan. It's an honor to be here. Big, big fan. We've been connected on Twitter for a long time. So again, just an honor to be be on the show and have a conversation with you. Hey, I feel, I feel the same way about the work you're doing. Uh and which we'll talk to, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on in the show. But I want to start off today's conversation by talking about uh, the reaction to Elon Musk buying Twitter. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter about this uh, online, uh, on Twitter, uh, in the media, uh, and there's there's really been two kind of main reactions. And honestly, I think they both they both miss the point, uh, at least in my opinion. Of course, there's conservatives who are celebrating uh, as though Elon Musk is going to single-handedly save free speech, uh, you know, despite the fact that he himself has worked to censor free speech uh, when it was unfavorable to him and, and it was workers who were trying to unionize uh, at one of his companies. Uh, also, I think this idea that any one person, especially a billionaire, will save us from a political and economic system that is rigged against uh, everyday people and rigged for billionaires like Elon Musk is pretty absurd, right? Nobody is coming to save us, especially the billionaires who benefit from the system the way that it, that it is. Uh, we have to save ourselves and save each other. Then, uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, liberals, uh, you know, are kind of reacting like Elon Musk acquiring Twitter was the end of the world and the end of free speech when, you know, Musk buying Twitter is just a continuation, really, of the status quo where oligarchs and giant, giant corporations already own our news media and they own both corporate parties. Let's talk facts here for a second. Currently, just six corporations own 90% of the media that the American people consume. And because of Citizens United, which gave corporations the right to buy our politicians and elections, both major parties are completely owned and controlled by corporations and oligarchs. So all of this hysteria and overreaction by liberals to me, it was really no different than the way they blamed Trump for all of our problems when he was president, right? Like, as if, you know, one corrupt president was the problem and not our entire corrupt system that puts the endless greed of the 1% uh, over the basic dignity of the 99%. And I think this really falls at the crux of, of what's wrong right now with Democrats and liberals is they'd rather just blame one person than ever admit, right, that their beloved Democratic Party is part of the corrupt system. So I just I kind of found it really uh, hypocritical to see liberals say like, oh, we're we're leaving Twitter now because it was purchased by an oligarch. Yet they refuse to leave the Democratic Party, which is also bought, paid for and, and controlled by oligarchs. Uh, Rob and Indy, do you want to jump in? What was your reaction to all of the, the chatter about Elon buying Twitter? And, and if we want a platform that truly promotes free speech, would it be better for it to be owned by one billionaire or should it be owned by the public? I've got a lot to say on that for sure. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, I, I think I agree with a lot of your your analysis with, with the reactions on the left and on the right. Um, and then you have the independent side, which was, meh, this is another billionaire buying a company from another billionaire. They're still going to have a board. Uh, I know he's going to take it private. Then there's even talk that maybe they're not, they're not even going to raise enough to make the sale happen. It could get torpedoed by the government. And this could all just be a stock pump up uh, of playing games by Elon, which we've seen him do both with Dogecoin and with Bitcoin before. Uh, so, so that's one of the analyses. Uh, the other big thing is, yeah, again, on the censorship side, I don't think that he's going to do anything on the censorship side with him as the new owner. Uh, maybe you'll get some accounts reinstated. They'll clean up some bots like he's talking about. And some people saw their Twitter account follow followers drop. But did their engagement with their actual community drop? I, I, I didn't see any of that. So th those were were two immediate things. Um, and then, of course, you know, Twitter stock price went up. So everybody made money and this worked out for the board. They got taken out at forty four dollars a share. And I'm sure they're going to all walk away with a pile of money. Yeah, I think this is kind of just another the the key thing that happens within the United States is consolidation. It's monopolizing. And so you have 
such a small group of people and they're consolidating wealth, they're consolidating property, they're consolidating the businesses that are used to inform the masses. And mm. so it's never a good thing um, to have one individual or one you know, minority group owning all of what we are consuming, what we're living with. So in that sense, you know, him buying Twitter doesn't, doesn't really make me feel all bright and happy that now it's a different age. It's just more rich people owning disproportionate amounts of wealth and property. And it's, it's frustrating because I don't think we're going to see a lot of people who have been silenced for their views on Palestine, for their views uh, in the anti-war movement. I don't think you're going to see those people embraced by the new Elon Musk ownership if it if it does end up happening. Mm. And to your point, Ryan, yeah. I think in general we've seen it when it comes to uh, Democrats and Republicans. Everyone's looking for a boogeyman. Everyone's looking for mm. an easy scapegoat to say this is the one thing that's holding up – Everything would be great utopia if it wasn't for this one guy or this one institution. But the reality is it's going to take a long, hard, a lot of probably violent revolution for us to get to the place where we need to be in a just society. And I think the longer people kind of sell themselves this lie that it's just one guy that's that's holding it up or it's just that party and not the other party. It's like the whole system is so rotted through and through. The only way that we're going to have what is just, what is equitable, what is right is is if the people rise up and say, we've had enough of the entire system. But if people think it's a little easier to just demonize one person or one group and, and whether it's Democrats blaming Republicans and Trump or it's uh, Republicans blaming trans people or immigrants, there's always going to be some scapegoat that that says, don't look at the whole system that's creating these situations that are oppressive and horrible. Just look at the people who we're going to say, point the spotlight on them. That's the sole issue. And that's a much easier sell to people of, you just need to change that and everything's better for you than, oh, by the way, you're going to need to be standing up against muddied interests for a very long time. And it will probably be a lot of state violence, a lot of like the, the most powerful entities in the world coming down and pushing back against you, that's not an easy sell for people. So I understand mm. why they create the the scapegoats, why they like to make it seem like it's just one issue. Um, but the reality is so much more <laughs> deep and it's going to be a much harder battle than people think if we want an actual yeah. just society. Rob, you're, I you're think you hit on a key point uh, because that's really at the crux of, of really everything right now is that essentially we have two corporately owned and, and, and controlled political parties whose sole function right now is really to turn the people against each other, right? To pit neighbor against neighbor, to pit, you know, different classes of people against each other, to pit different races against each other, to pit us against people against immigrants. And the reason that they do this, the reason that both of these parties spend so much time turning us against each other is because then they can turn around and go, oh, look, we're the ones that can, we're the only ones who can save us from this, right? And, and that was what got me in the 2020 election is if you look, like on election night, I just remember seeing the main message from each party and Democrats, the message was, you got to vote for us to because we're the only ones who can save this country from the Republicans, you know, from the big, bad, scary Republicans. And the Republicans message was, no, 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 you got to vote for our party because we're the only ones that can save you from, you know, the big, bad, scary Democrats. And right. so neither- either- one is literally like scapegoating the other side and turning the people against each other. And the one thing I always like to tell people, and that was really key to my kind of political awakening, is the parties who are actively rigging the system against us, they are never going to going to reform or fix the, the very system that they're profiting off of. And the reason they spend so much time dividing us is because the actual solution is, is for the people to come together and to unite on, on core issues that we all agree on, which, and there are many issues in this country that we all agree on, especially economically. We want a, we want an economy that works for everyone. And so that's why they spend so much time turning us against each other is because they don't want us to come together because that's a threat to their power. Um, I want to point out something Elon said to, to kind of to, to get back to the conversation here, uh, you know, about Elon buying Twitter. One of the biggest concerns that I have, it kind of plays into everything we're talking about right now with, with Elon owning Twitter, is that he doesn't really understand, ironically, free speech and how our laws are manipulated by the courts uh, to protect corporate interests instead of the people's interests. And I'm going to I'm going to read a tweet he just tweeted yesterday. Uh, Elon tweeted, and I quote, 
By free speech, I simply mean that which matches the law. If people want less free speech, they will ask the government to pass laws to that effect. Therefore, going beyond the law is contrary to the will of the people. Now, <laughs> here is what is so problematic about Elon's statement and about his views on free speech. You know, he calls himself a, a champion of free speech, but he doesn't really understand it. Uh, because despite the fact that, yes, the First Amendment is supposed to protect the people's right to free speech and assembly from government infringement, the courts have ruled under Citizens United that the First Amendment should also apply to corporations. And they ruled that corporations should be allowed to make unlimited contributions to political campaigns. The courts in this country actually use the First Amendment that is supposed to protect the people's right to, to free speech to give corporations not only the right to free speech, but the right to buy our elections and politicians. So this idea that, you know, Elon Musk has that if the people want more free speech, that we can just ask the government to pass laws to make it happen is completely disconnected from our current reality, where the government and both parties completely ignore what the people want. And instead, they write laws and they interpret laws in a way that gives more power to the corporations and billionaires uh, who own both parties. So Elon owning Twitter is not going to lead to this free speech utopia that conservatives envision or frankly be the end of free speech or the end of the world as liberals were envisioning. It's just simply going to uphold the current status quo where corporations and billionaires have more rights, liberties, and freedom than actual people. Uh, do you guys find Elon's comments about free speech being whatever the law says troubling when, like I said, our current laws are written or interpreted to protect corporate interests instead of the people's interests? Well, and think about all the things that were not law, you know, that were law against, you know, for example, separate drinking fountains, for example. They're wrong, but they, they're they law, but they're wrong, and laws are also meant to be changed. So, <clears throat> you know, th th that's definitely an issue. You know, you, you touched on something before, and you were talking about public Twitter, and should the public own a social media platform? There actually is an open source version of very similar to Twitter called Mastodon. I did want to, to, to shout that out. Um, and there are people moving there on a daily basis. And that is not controlled by the government. It's controlled by nobody. And, and it's somewhere where we can all get together. And sh it's not as feature re rich necessarily. And it doesn't have the kind of support. But that that's one alternative. And maybe something that, that we should explore further. Again, looking mm -hmm. into open source type of platforms that no one billionaire or corporation has control of. Um, but as far as, yeah, Elon's uh, free speech is definitely an issue. Also, liberals leaving Twitter, hilarious. They're still on Facebook. So they're <laughs> they're leaving Twitter, but they're staying on, on another billionaire-owned platform. Uh, and Instagram as well, TikTok, you name it. So yeah, And they also kind of missed the whole point that, like, before this billionaire bought Twitter, another billionaire owned it, right? It just went from oligarch to oligarch. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and and not to mention, like, when we talk about <laughs> just the kind of business owner Elon Musk is, again, he didn't invent Tesla. He bought a, like, an ownership chunk uh, of the shares. And, and, like, he's a guy who, during the pandemic, the early waves of the pandemic, I live in, li lived in the Bay Area and I'm moving back. But I remember the county that the Tesla factory is in, in I believe, Fremont, California, there were mm -hmm. mandatory... Uh, stay at home orders during the first you know few weeks of our of our quote unquote lockdown and Elon Musk literally said to his workers if you don't show up to work like I'm gonna fire you I don't care what they're saying like putting the the onus of responsibility on on his employees to come in and imagine you're a, a minority right and you work for t uh, for Tesla and you're gonna what go out and and potentially get pulled over by the police and have to have an interaction with the police that are already armed to the teeth, always looking for instigation. And, and you're going to take that on every day so that you can go to work to make money for a man who's rich beyond belief and brags about coups in, in Bolivia and brags that like, you know, he can fix any idea. Oh, I'll just put a tunnel underneath and that'll, you know, alleviate the traffic on freeways. And it's like, it, he's got so many terrible ideas, like genuinely horrible ideas, but he has this, thing called money and unfortunately in america we we idolize wealth and wealthy people so much 
we genuinely believe as a country that like anyone who has that much wealth has to at least be smart because if they weren't smart, they wouldn't be able to make wealth. And unfortunately, I think in, in our particular society, you don't need to be smart to make money. You need to have no ethics. You need to be okay exploiting people. These are the things that lead to, uh, you know, leeching off other people, off your workers. And so the idea that uh, there would be better conditions for the people using Twitter, I think is laughable. Um, I also don't know if he buys, you know, however many shares of Twitter, how much say he's actually going to get, how much the other shareholders are going to let him just kind of quote run the show. Um, but again, it's, it's never a good thing when a billionaire has disproportionate control and say an influence. And unfortunately, that's just how our society in this country is set up is to where we reward people who have money by giving them unearned legitimacy. And we think like, if you say anything bad about Elon Musk on Twitter, you're going to get a ton of guys in your replies being like, actually, Elon's a genius. Actually, he's brilliant. And it's like, people just equate having wealth to being so smart and it couldn't be further from the truth. Especially, well, It feels, it feels kind of like a, it feels like a playground fight. Like our billionaires better than your billionaire. You know, our billionaire is less corrupt than your billionaire. Our, our corporate party is better than your corporate party. You know, like it mm. literally, it does. It feels like it, it, there is, we, we put wealth on a pedestal. We put greed on a pedestal. We put, you know, all these things up on a pedestal that people think, is what success looks like. And so of course people are going to chase it. People are going to look up to those, those people and people are going to look to these people as saviors, you know? And, and look, there's, there's, there's kind of this movement right now that everyone, cause there is a lot of censorship. I see people get censored on, on, on the right and on the left. Um, and what's interesting is I don't actually see many people that I would call in this, in the corporate extreme center, um, ever get censored. Uh, and that kind of gets to, to the next thing I wanted to bring up. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain that more. Yes, I, I would call the center of American politics extreme. And, and I'll explain in a second here. Um, but uh, Elon tweeted, uh, he said this yesterday, which is something else I feel kind of disconnected from reality. But he tweeted, and I quote, for Twitter to deserve public trust, it must be politically neutral, which effectively means upsetting the far right and the far left equally. Now, this is a very popular sentiment among what I would call the elites of our society. And when I refer to when I say the term elites, here's what I mean. I mean the corporate media. I mean both corporate parties and wealthy liberals and conservatives. Uh, and what they do is they they try to paint the far left and right as the extremes when in reality, the extremely bloated military budgets, the extreme climate breakdown, and the extreme levels of inequality that we see in our society today are a result of policies that didn't come from the extreme left or right, but what I would call the extreme center. It's a corporate extremism, which puts the profits of corporations above the basic needs of the people and planet. And this corporate extremism Extremism has a bipartisan consensus from the establishment of both parties. Elon literally believes the political center is where you find neutrality. But I would argue that the political center is where you find corporate, the corporate greed that is destroying our society and destroying our planet. Because at the center of the American politi political system lies the two parties which are controlled by corporate and, and billionaire owned interests. What does it tell you guys about Elon that he has the same political philosophy really as the establishment? That, that it's the right and left that are the extremists, but the, but the centrists, they're, they're the right ones. The very ones who lead us into war, who, you know, again, bail out Wall Street when the, econo when the economy collapses, when Wall Street causes our economies to collapse like, like they did in 2008. What does what the, the centrists in our government do? They bail out the corporations who cause the collapse, right? I mean, this is where every policy that, that it's tilted in favor of the billionaire class and against the working class literally comes out of what CNN and MSNBC and Fox News calls the center. So like, I just think that that word is so loaded and dangerous because there's nothing really centrist about kind of the corporate rot that is destroying our society. Well, what is it at the center in between? It's the center in between two corporate defined narratives to begin with. <clears throat> exactly. That are both ca that, that are both based in in capitalism as the root. Okay, that don't put the worker first. That put the the executives and uh, you know and, and and advocate for the inequality that we have, and are doing nothing about what's happening in the system. Uh, because again, like you said, they're they're wildly profiting from it, so they have no interest in changing it. 
and they'll speak to lip service. They understand that the, the, that people are suffering because they're inflicting it. Um, but again, and and they feel badly about that. But at the same time, they would rather that happen than them have to reduce their style, their standard, their style of living, whatever. And and again, a lot of it is just it boils down to greed. And that's the saddest part is, is the greed at, at the top that you see. And it just greed begets greed. And you're, you're seeing these, these billionaires. Again, I know you said many times there should be no billionaires. I, I agree. I, I don't know what the answer is uh, to build up a company that grows to that level. Do you, are you forced to divest? Is there a maximum cap? I, I don't know what you give. You give the profits to the people who created the wealth in the first place, which is the workers. I mean, I just look at it very simply, but that's a radical statement to people who've been kind of indoctrinated to live in our hierarchical society, which says, you know, that there has to be a ruling class uh, that gets to exploit the the working class and the poor. Because remember, like if there was, there would not be a ruling class in society if there wasn't a, a, a poor and a working class. Uh, to create them. That's literally how they're the rulers because they, they literally exploit the labor of billions of people to, to pad their, their bottom line. That's literally how it works. It's how the system has worked. And I just think if you want to live in a, in an equal balanced society that we have to start kind of having difficult conversations about the way society is structured. And if this, this, this society is actually sustainable into our future. And what I find very interesting though is just how the establishment and now even Elon Musk how they love to demonize like the Bernie group, you know, the far, which they call far left, which really isn't far left at all. And they love to kind of demonize Trump supporters. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a reason they do this, right? Because they know that like at its core, the people that look to Trump or look to Bernie, they understand working class people understand that their lives don't get better uh, no matter who's in power, right? No matter if it's a, a, a blue corporate president or corporate party in power or a red corporate party their lives keep getting better year after year. Like you can't lie to people who are poor and working class. Th th their bank accounts literally show them how much money they have. I think some of these kind of uh, these corporate hacks on CNN or even Fox News think that they can get up there and like and lie to people. And people are like, dude, my bank account is the same or even it, and it just keeps getting worse and worse over the last 40 years as the rich keep getting richer in this country. But I think the reason they spend so much time demonizing because they know people are people went to Trump to find hope. People went to Bernie to find hope because there is no hope in the political establishment. There is no hope from these corrupt politicians who just literally use our government to enrich themselves and enrich their corporate donors. And so really by demonizing kind of what they call the far left and right, they prevent any mass coalition of, of the working class from ever coming together. And because that at its core is the greatest threat to the billionaires and to our government is a coalition of poor and working class people from every background that maybe had voted for Trump in the past or Bernie or whoever. It's if literally the working class in this country and people who care about dignity and justice, if, if we could all come together, that's how we end this corrupt system that, that caters to the billionaire. So I just I thought it was so interesting that that Elon was literally parroting the establishment talking points that they use to kind of demonize Bernie people and Trump people and anyone who who wants a, a better system and a better world. Rob, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I want to make sure D stay in the queue. I'll take your call. I just have like 30 seconds um, and then we'll take a call. Yeah, let's get to I D. Think it's, it's really interesting how we define what is the extreme left and extreme right, because globally, what is seen as left and right is different than in America. Like yes. what a lot of people would consider the Democratic Party in America, people might say that's the left wing of the United States. And the Democratic Party in America is like in terms of health care, in terms of a lot of like social programs further to the right than like some of these right-wing parties in in other parts of the globe and so Correct. it's not a an accurate characteris characterization and i think similarly to how we need to constantly defend our like when people say what is communism no we as communists we as socialists we need to define what it is properly we need to stop letting other people define what we are for us and so when we can actually say no no the extreme left doesn't exist in this country really if you think about it but globally where we would say the the leftmost pillars are if that's your true left endpoint um the center is a lot more to the left than even the democratic party in this country but if you say that the people who are in these positions of power the pundits at these you know very expensive uh 
cable news networks and everything, they'll cry, well, everything's getting too woke. Oh, there's too much left. And it's like the reality is um, their definition of left ends very, very abruptly <laughs> and does not extend all the way into the um, the anti-capitalist, uh, whether you are a, uh, a Stalinist, a Leninist, a Maoist, an anarchist, anything like that is is not even – considered in the view of what we have like in the quote left of our country people are there but they're not recognized by um our our own media apparatus so yeah uh, no that's a good point rob i mean the the democratic party is is further to the right on issues like health care than the tories than the right-wing party in in the united kingdom so in many ways we are governed by two kind of right-wing capitalist and imperialist imperialist parties so you know and something like social democracy which they have more in Europe, we don't even have anything close to that because, again, we're governed by kind of two corporate parties. But and, and look, I am a socialist, but I also I I'm getting more on the train of like, although I am a socialist, I am all about talking to anyone like, all, you know, there's this kind of this urgency in American politics to like, oh, my God, you can't talk to them because they're a right winger. It's like, do you want to be in the business of like talking to people and bringing people onto your side and uh, you know, or do you want to be in the business of just like, oh, I can't talk to this person. I can't debate this person. I should just, st-, you know, like that to me, like is how they keep us divided. Like they use these kind of right and left monikers when I think at its core, you know, people just want to live in a better world. They want an economy that works for them. They want, uh, they want health care. They want to be able to, you know, protect their families and keep their families safe. They want to be happy. They want freedom, liberty, all the things that, we're supposed to that were promised to us in our constitution that have fall that, that are not a reality anymore because of the greed at the top and because of the ruling class that really dominates both parties and dominates the the conversation in this country but yeah i mean the right left paradigm i mean again i am a socialist but i am not opposed to you know there's some libertarians that i've spoken with that are more anti-war than than these liberal democrats you know, so like they're like I agree with certain libertarians on the fact that they don't support the military industrial complex, that they oppose the wars that the United States wants to fund. You know, there's ways to look for consensus. And the other thing that I'll just say is, you know, look, I have family members who voted for Trump and I was it's one point in my politics. I was so indoctrinated by the Democratic Party. I'm very honest about this. Like back in 2016, I, even though I voted for Bernie in the primary, I was such a lifelong Democrat and obedient Democrat. The, the Democrats at that point in my life literally convinced me that every single Republican in this country is a racist. And it wasn't until I realized that this party that's calling everyone else a racist actually has racist policies and actually like wrote the crime bill and actually like Obama built the cages that Trump put the kids in. You know, when I finally realized that the Democrats also support all of these racist imperialist wars and, and dropping bombs on predominantly black and brown countries. It wasn't that like here these Democrats are literally accusing 80 million Americans of being racist while at the same time like supporting racist policies. So who are they to, to get to like decide things here? And again, that's but that's what the Democrats do. They want us to be divided, just like the Republicans want us to be divided, because they don't want the people to come together. It's a threat to their power. That's why the Democrats also spend so much time trying to uh, kick third parties off ballots and actually suing to kick parties like the Green Party off ballots. So, you know, although I am definitely a, a socialist and I believe that the working class, uh, the society would be better and would be more even if the working class made the decisions and if the working class owned the means of production. Um I think society would be more sustainable and it would be better. Um, but, you know, we can have that disagreement, but I'm not opposed to talking with anyone on the right. Like many Democrats, if they heard me say this right now, they'd just say, oh, Ryan's a Trump supporter and a racist. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's literally all Democrats have done in the last six years. And where has it gotten us? Are black and brown people in this country any better off? No. Are we any closer to reparations? Are we any closer to health care for everyone? No. We're just more divided than we've ever been. Even now that Trump is gone with Biden in office, we're more divided. And that's because both parties continue to divide and conquer. That's it. Um, let's get to D. Hey, what's up? Hey, how's it going? Yeah. So, you know, I want to just preface this by saying that I'm a Bernie guy. I voted for him two times. The thing I would just push back on is one, I think it's a mistake for um, leftists to who are like burning a line to ignore the culture war and kind of have the, um, a kumbaya moment because 
as much as I agree with Ryan's sentiment about the working class coming together, I don't think it's a reality because I don't think that a lot of people who are working class, they, they, I think the culture war precedes a lot of material gains for a lot of people who are working class. So I think it's a mistake mm-hmm. when the left starts to say, well, we can work with people who are live in some of these red states who are working class. Cause a lot of them, if, if it were ever came to like, say, you know, I don't know, a Nina Turner or something versus, Ben Shapiro, even if Nina, say, offers material things, they're going to vote for Ben Shapiro. And I think we on the left kind of need to come to terms w- with things like that. Um, and with even if we're trying to get like normie Democrats, I, I don't mean like wealthy Democrats. I mean, establishment Democrats in places like South Carolina that helped Biden get the nomination. The left needs to make the case that we we're not going to call every Trump voter racist for sure, but we are. So yeah, like I agree with you, but like, how, cause just to, just to kind of push in a little sure. bit, how I agree. Like if th- I'm not saying there isn't, you know, neo-Nazis on the far right, of course there are. I'm not saying there's not white supremacists on the right, but is that the majority of the coalition? I mean, there's been studies done that, that, you know, by groups that liberals love, you know, that say that there's about five to 10 million uh, you know, white supremacists in America, you know? And so my point was, is like, even if someone maybe in the past voted Republican, do you automatically say, oh, you voted Republican in the past. We've got to kick you out of our coalition. No, I don't You can't come that. with us. You can't, you can't build a better, more equal society where everyone has health care and housing and food and where the workers own the means of production because you voted. You know, that for me is the sentiment though with most liberals. Like, you know, yeah. even though I've never voted for a Republican in my life, the moment I left the Democratic Party in 2020 and started working with third parties, started, you know, supporting people like Shama Savant and and independent socialist parties. I was called a racist and a Trump supporter when I've never voted for a Republican in my life. Like, that's the go to, though, for most of these liberals that like they're so conditioned to divide us. But I do think, though, I do think and this is maybe you're going to disagree with. I do think the criticism from a lot of people is insincere and a lot of liberals are right. Don't want any of that, but there have been a lot of leftists who play this game where it's like, well, the Republicans are this working class majority party. And it's like, you can, you can, you can can disagree. (laughs) Yeah. But I'm saying they're prominent people who do like, Mm. including, I don't want to throw stones, but like people like Glenn Green, like who it's like, you can do that, but also you have to be able to, on the left, you can criticize the Democratic Party, but as long as you're making it clear that, like, the Republicans want to overturn Roe v. Wade, they are trying to get teachers fired, like, they're not a, they're not the grass is greener on the other side party. And no, I think more absolutely people not. on the left need to do that. So I'm yeah. also going to push back a little bit and say that, that a lot of that is led by the billionaires on the right yeah. and that the Republican citizens, the, the the average Joe in the Republican Party, who they're watching Fox News, and that's the talking points that's being yeah. fed to them on the nightly Fox yep. News. And that's why they're getting stirred up in a frenzy over yeah. it. And if they were being told about health care and they were being told about you know inequality, yeah. and they were being told about mutual aid, and they were being told about Julian Assange, and once in a while they are, thankfully, Jimmy Dore's allowed up there to talk about Julian Assange. Yeah. Julian Assange I want to say that. Um, but but for sure, I mean, these are the things that, you know, the entire narrative managers in the, the and, and then that's what's being sold to you by the Democrats. Is that's yeah. what the Republicans are, is what you see on Fox News. But that's not what your average Republican voter is. I, I, I just don't see that. And I think there is a, a unity. I think we all want health care. I think we all want fair wages and, and, and living wages for the 40 hours that we work. I think we all want, uh, yeah. again... Not just healthcare, but dental, vision, mental, the entire thing included, like they give us in every other civilized country in the world and gaslight us into believing that we yeah. can't hear. I, awesome. think, I think what D, what you're saying is we can't also like pretend that racism doesn't exist. Because racism uh, because it does exist and it's been institutionalized in to our system. I mean, the way I look at our system here is it's it's literally our capitalist, imperialist system yeah. that racism is a big part of. Um, but at the same time, like when you what what uh, what Andy said is so spot on. I mean, the people who get their news from from the kind of the right wing echo chamber, they've literally for the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, they've yeah. been given these kind of messages about, oh, the immigrants are coming to take your jobs. You know, they've been given this fear monger, this message of fear, this message of fear, the other. And so and I think instead of the Democrats, instead of offering a counter narrative. They just kind of, yep, yep, 
If you vote for a Republican, yeah. you're a racist. Like, is that how you get someone to your side by just calling 80 yeah. million people Nazis and racist? No. Like, and so that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying like, let's pretend yeah. that racism doesn't exist. No, it absolutely exists here. You know, this country was founded on racism. Well, but it's if not we a, ever it's... want to build a better world, we've got to build coalitions where we can talk about these things and where we can want to have a spirit of solidarity amongst the people. Forget about these, these parties. Forget about these billionaires. Forget about the people that want us to stay divided so they can continue to profit off of us. Let's let's form coalitions where everyone is included, where we can hear from everyone. And that's what we're doing right now. And so, I mean, yeah, I really appreciate yeah, I what you're saying. And, I, and look, I, I, the reason I trash more lately on the Democrats than the, than the Republicans is because I was a Democrat for 18 years, because yeah. I fell for their platitudes. I literally thought that Obama was going to heal the planet. I mean, I was the biggest Obama supporter. I thought he was the answer. But because I was falling for all their platitudes. You know, the Democrats will look at, will look into the camera and tell people, you know, in their campaign, campaign speeches that they want health care for everyone, right? Or that climate change is real. And then they'll turn around and literally give bigger subsidies to the giant insurance companies. Or they'll do what Joe Biden's do, doing right now. And he's literally continuing Trump's policy of privatizing Medicare, right? Yeah, or giving more, uh, uh, giving more subsidies to the big oil companies, doing the very opposite. He'll say climate change is real, but then he'll literally invest in, in more yeah. drilling and more fracking. So for me, that to me is just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, because the Democrats kind of sedate people with these platitudes and they say, we're on your side. And they give great speeches. I fell for every single one of Obama's speeches until the wool got pulled over my eyes, until finally I started to realize Democrats have been making these promises every cycle, every election in my life. It's like, you got to vote for us. You got to vote for us in this election because the Republicans are just too bad, right? You got to vote for us. Real change can wait. Meaningful change can wait until next time. We just need to vote out the Republicans in this cycle. Well, you know what? We're now at the point where like meaningful change can't wait anymore because the cost is our people are suffering. You know, we got 140 million Americans who are poor or low income. 80 million people are either underinsured or uninsured. The black white wealth gap is wider than it's ever been, even dating back to the civil rights mo movement. That's where it is right now. And so we don't have time to wait for meaningful change. Change needs to happen right now. So this political party that keeps sedating people with these platitudes. Now, if you're a comfortable liberal who has a job and you have yeah. money in the bank and you have health care, sure, all you need to do is hear. Obama or Kamala or well, I'm not even, judge spouting I'm not even talking about, but like, I'm not even talking about this. you need uh, better than that. We need better than Democrats and Republicans. Well, I'm not even talking about, by the way, I just want to make clear before I hang up, when I talk about comfortable liberals, I don't even talk, I'm not even talking about like wealthy people in the suburbs. I'm talking about their lib their people. Like if you look at the black voters in South Carolina who are, who, who, help Biden win the primary. They're normie Democrats like that who just make average salary. And I want the left to be able to convince those people we are an effective tool to fight the the other side. And and even with the Biden student loan debt, I, I, I hope he passes it. But I do hope if he passes the student loan debt, I hope No, he just came out today. He that's yeah. the thing. Again, we can't fall for these promises. Sorry to intrude, but before people get the wrong information, Biden came out today and said he's not going to uh, cancel even fifty thousand dollars worth of student loan debt. That 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 people were miss miss that, that they were confused about what he was saying. So he's already backtracked on that. They're not going to cancel it. Yeah, that's. that's I can give thing. you the exact. I can I can yeah. give people the exact quote. I had it right I, here. I would love to just get like a minute to real quick say. I think it's very Please. important as as people on the left, right, as communists, socialists, as pro worker, pro union yeah. people. We need to make sure that. There is an a, a, an ability for people to switch sides, so to speak, but we do not ever try to win a Republican over by talking Republican talking points. We do not capitulate to them. We don't try to meet them halfway. We let them know this is what we believe. These are our values. We stand firm. We don't accommodate whatever racism, yeah. homophobia. That is not allowed where we are. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to change your material well-being. If you're going to get caught up in culture war bullshit, like I would love to educate you so that you see past that. But we're not like going to make people on the left who are black and brown and trans and, you know, oppressed people. We're not going to have it be a, a, a space that's not safe for them to organize just right. so we can try to win over Republicans. And I think 
constantly that's the the argument that gets made is well if you want to talk to these republicans you know you're going to just end up agreeing with them and then then the people who are the left base within your organization are going to be unhappy with it that's not at all what we should be doing we should well, educate the, you go ahead i just wanted to say the just one comment and then one question i'll hang up um the late there's a late guy I used to follow named uh, michael brooks he was one of my favorite leftist commentators um, and his his uh, his stance uh, was that he's like if someone comes to like canvas with us and says I I want like I don't think gay people should have rights then we need to throw them out but if someone comes trying to canvas with uh, leftists and says like I listen to a I don't know a Chappelle show or I listen to Dave Chappelle we can't be like oh my god so there's a substantive difference between rights and then like sort of like just things that normal people can like listen to or whatever. There's a substantive difference. And then, but my last question was, um, what do you think of, because this is a common talk, a thing I've heard of the fact that, um, sometimes people will say they want something and then don't want something. And I would just point to the fact that Democrats in West Virginia have bemoaned Joe Manchin, who I'm not a fan of. I think he's awful, but he wins in West Virginia. And we ran in 2020, um, a justice Democrat who ran on all the progressive notions and she did worse than Joe Biden. So do you think some states are just so red that only a moderate Democrat can win? Because we've tried that in uh, places like West Virginia and, uh, you know, we've in other places where people have underperformed kind of the more establishment candidate in a red area. So that, that's, that's a I, really good question. First, I just want to let people know. So the quote that Biden said this morning, he says, and I quote, I am not considering $50,000 in student debt reduction. So that was his big quote from this morning. Uh, it was, you know, I, I'm not surprised. This is what I expect from the Democrats that during election season, they know that they haven't done anything to improve the people's material conditions. So now come all the promises, right? I mean, if you look back, Nancy Pelosi, when she ran for office in the 90s, she was she was talking about single payer health care. The Democrats have been talking about single payer health care, universal health care for 25 years. They've been promising it. Well, now that they have the House, Senate and White House, they won't even vote. They won't even bring Medicare for all to a floor vote. So, like, I'm done with, like, the promises that Democrats give uh, during election season. Uh, but D, to respond to your question, which I think was really good. The thing you have to remember is, uh, even though, you know, the, the Joe Manchins of the world and, and these corporate Democrats who keep winning, remember that the, the it's it's not necess- the people vote uh, based on kind of the information they're given. Well, where are people getting their information? You know, this comes back to what we talked about earlier in the show. Ninety percent of the media that people consume in this country are owned by six corporations, control literally 90 percent of the media outlets that people get their media from. So when people are getting their 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 information from corporate media and from, you know, from CNN, from MSNBC, do you ever hear MSNBC and CNN talking favorably about health care for all? No. During the primary, they were literally had a different expert on every day to shit on Medicare for all and to scare people away from it. And, and because the, the for profit insurance companies advertise on their network. So a lot of time, the, a lot of the reason D people keep reelecting these these corporate politicians is because that's who the Democratic Party is telling them to vote for. You know, the the Senate PAC, there, there's PACs that control the House uh, re-election candidates and, and the Senate re-election candidates. Chuck Schumer controls the Senate committee. And, and I can't remember who does the Democrats now uh, because they just they, they switched it recently. But they have money and they give they spend like when people like Charles Booker runs, who I supported a few years back. They gave money to Amy McGrath, the corporate candidate. They got they like $50 million she raised to just get smoked by the Republicans. So the Democrats and the billionaires who, who fund the Democratic Party, they're spending money to stop left candidates from winning in the Democratic Party. They do that for the Senate races. They do that in the House races. They're actively spending money and and strategizing to prevent left-wing candidates from winning. And then when we do get left-wing candidates, people like AOC or, or, or Rashida Tlaib, the, literally, they, they, they are so terrified to stand up to Pelosi, to stand up to the corporate 
the, to the corporate interests that control their party that that nothing happens, right? Like AOC has one of the biggest platforms in the country. She could be using it to, to call out the corporate money that is preventing Democrats from voting on Medicare for all. She could be using it to call out Joe Biden for the reason he won't support a Green New Deal uh, because of the because of the fossil fuel money that, that gets poured into the Democrats coffers and the Republicans, both parties. But AOC won't do that. In fact, she's pivoted to only now calling out the Republicans. Change isn't going to happen that way. We need people who are independent, who, yes, are socialists, but are not captured by either of the corporate parties. I see no change ever coming as long as the Democrats are actively fighting back against the left. That's the function of the party. They are literally the GOP's greatest ally in preserving the corporate oligarchy. The, 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 Repu- the, the Democrats don't want change. That's why they fought harder against Bernie Sanders than they've ever fought against Donald Trump. That's why right now you, they're, they're not fighting to, to, codify, to, to codify Roe. They're not. I mean, the Democrats could legislate right now. They have the House. And then they could bring legislation in the Senate to force the Republicans, force every single Republican to vote against Medicare for all. They won't even do that. They won't even they use wanna, they their don't platforms wanna... to force these issues because they're corrupt and they're controlled by the same corporate interests that control the Republicans. So this idea that like we're going to get change out of the Democrats, sure, they give great speeches. But again, we're way past the point of platitudes fixing any of the inequality and injustice in this country. And, and we're way past the point of like Democrats being like, we care about black and brown people and then give more money to, to the police. Biden gave more money to the police in his first year than Trump even did. So like, I just we're way past the point of like just pretending that the Democrats aren't really the same as Republicans. I wish it was different. It'd certainly be easier to try to change the Democratic Party. But like, how much longer are we going to wait for them to change? Are we going to wait until they rig it against AOC in 2028? Because they will. You know, you can do everything they want. And the DNC is always going to rig it for their corporate candidate. They don't want even a Democratic Socialist in their party to win, uh, you know, the presidency. And they and they purged a lot of the left in 2020 and replaced it with never Trump Republicans. So what you really have is a corporate uniparty. And the only yep. real difference is on social issues within the Democratic Party, which, again, is but why the- they give lip service to. Like if the Democrats were actually fighting to give to improve the material conditions of my black and brown comrades, I'd be all for it. But they're yep. not. They're like nope. literally using and weaponizing the pain of marginalized communities and saying, we got your back. We got your back. You know, we support. I'm gay myself. I've been pandered to by the Democrats since the beginning of time. They say they care about the LGBTQ community. No, they don't. They care about our votes. They show up at, at the pride parades. I call it rainbow capitalism. They don't. If they did care about the marginalized people in our community, they'd be fighting for trans people to have health care, which is what they need more than anything. But they're not. Again, so like, what is more dangerous? A party that actively tells you they hate you or a party that says we're your friend and we got your back, but then stabs you in the back and just leaves you and, and, and doesn't do anything to actually help you. That to me is what makes the Democrats so dangerous. And I'm not the first person to say this. This was literally basically Malcolm X's entire political philosophy and same with MLK's where they basically warn society, not about the overt racists, not about the KKK. Yeah, they're dangerous. But what's more dangerous is the people who poses your ally and then stab you in the back. And that's what both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. said about the white liberal and the white moderate. And that's really what we're what we're seeing is they are the ones in society that are standing in the way of the progress that we so desperately need, that our marginalized community so desperately needed. So like if I saw the Democrats even going a hint towards like strong social reforms that would help marginalized people, I would be all for it. But we are in a moment of massive levels of inequality. And the Democrats, they're not just anti-revolutionary. They're also anti-reform. The Democrats are anti-Medicare for all. They're anti-Green New Deal. They're anti-reparations. They're anti-living wage. They're anti every kind of socialist or populist policy that would actually improve the material conditions of the people. And anytime they say they support them, it's just so they can get they can win power and then serve Wall Street and serve their corporate donors. And I've watched this play out over and over and over again. And I just think people, most liberals, especially myself, I didn't want to admit that I was betrayed. Nobody wants to admit that they've been betrayed or that they were wrong about the Democrats for 20 years. But that's what I realized I had to do. And I think that's what millions of people need to do before we'll ever see any change in this society. Because look right now, if you think the Democrats are going to deliver change, they've got the they've got the House, they've got the Senate, they've got the White House. They have the levers of power. And what are they doing? 
giving more money to the military. They are starting, they're giving more money to Ukraine, fighting a proxy war against Russia, using Ukraine to fight a proxy war against Russia. They are um, not supporting Medicare for all. Uh, You know, they did not vote for, they did not pass a living wage. I mean, over and over again, they betray us. When are we going to listen? Like how much more, you know, how much, how much more betrayal do the, do the people need to see before they finally stand up to the Democratic Party? Because until we do that, we'll never get something better. You don't get anything better than Democrats or Republicans if you won't fight for something better. And so a party like the Democrats, every election, they're like, oh, you just got to vote for us because the other people are bad. In my opinion, you're just as bad because you collaborate with the Republicans to funnel more money to the ruling class and to your corporate donors. Yeah, 58 uh, percent recently came out the, the uh, a survey, 58 percent of, of people surveyed would vote for a third party or an independent over Trump and Biden. I think more people are waking up to the two corporate parties and are starting to either check out, which is what you know the billionaires want, or to get organized, which is what we want to help your neighbor, mutual aid. And again, don't focus so much on the Republican and the Democratic Party because it's red versus blue while they run away with the green. I, you know, I, somebody brilliant said that somewhere, and I love I love saying that somewhere. Also, again, mutual corruption. So the Democrats don't want to hold a vote because they'll expose Joe Manchin, who's a Democrat themselves, and they'll have egg on their faces for bringing it up in the first place to fail. It's absolutely silly. So so now you can't ever bring up a a piece of legislation that will fail. Women's rights didn't pass the first time. Civil rights didn't pass the first time. We're not. I mean, these large legislations take time to, to shift mind mindsets and narratives over decades at times, and they're actively stifling that from happening in the name of greed, corporate profit, and causing suffering for millions in the process. So I, I stand with, with you. I stand with the workers. I, I stand with, you know, with the average people against these oligarchs, against these billionaires, against these platforms. I advocate for open source stuff wherever we possibly can use it, like OBS, you know, for, for producing live streams and things, and Mastodon, all, all these open source platforms to try to uh, get away from from billionaire controlled entities. I think the most powerful thing we as individuals can do is educate. At a time where, you know what, what is determining what most people think on a day to day basis? It's the information they're receiving and where are they getting <laughs> these sources from? A lot of them are from corporate entities. They're from you know the New York Times, the CNNs, the Fox News, the MSNBCs of the world, and they will always spin things in their way. There's no such thing as an unbiased source. It just, it doesn't exist. And so knowing that diversifying where you're getting your information from is important. Using critical thinking skills to kind of see through and piece through some of this stuff, because on the surface, there are a lot of things that sound really great and it's really convenient to believe. And it makes it seem like a solution is very simple, cut and dry. And the reality doesn't reflect that. And I think that whether it's, you know, fighting for education reform. So we're teaching actual history. I know there's a, uh, a big push. It's, it's always so frustrating seeing the, like the, the very quiet majority sits aside while a very loud minority um, are pushing for teachers to not be able to teach a wide range of topics. And it's like, man, we are so far from teaching the truth of this country. And like, just how much genocide and murder and slavery and exploitation built everything that we have here, not just in America. You could look at King Leopold in Belgium. You can look at how most of the countries in the global north have built their wealth has come through exploitation in the global south. That is not taught to me. I went to a very, like, in the Bay Area, very progressive, liberal school, and we didn't learn any of this stuff, right? It it comes after the fact. It wasn't even in college that I learned most of this stuff. It was after college, kind of having this curious mind that I wanted to see, like, some of this stuff doesn't seem to really fit with what I'm seeing. And you do a little more research and you do a little more digging. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, they undersold a lot of things. And so For me, I personally, like when I'm at work, I always talk about the importance of labor unions. I always talk about the importance of not letting your workers exploit you. And for for some people, I know that's very uncomfortable and it's just, it's not fair to ask them to do that. But if you do have the time and energy and you are doing your research, even if it's just pushing back against some corporate talking points that everyone will just parrot like, well, you know, communism doesn't work. It only works on paper. And I can say, okay, what about 
XYZ instance of the CIA coming in to overthrow the democratically elected communist or socialist leadership within Latin America or within Africa or within Asia, right? And once you kind of put the seed of doubt, it gets them to start asking questions. It's a thankless job. Uh, mm. it, it seems like a, a Sisyphusian effort at times. But I really do think the way that we get through this is educating people. And the first step oftentimes is shattering the initial illusion, which we've all been taught American exceptionalism through school. America's number one. The American dream is real. You work hard enough. You get everything you want, blah, blah, blah. And then you graduate and you have student debt and you can't find any jobs that pay a living wage. And you're pushing 30 living with your parents. And you're like, well, this this isn't what I was told was going to happen. So we want to make sure we're we're being kind to people. Um, it's very, very jarring to go from thinking that your country is great and everything's fine to realizing that like your country has bombed God knows how many countries throughout the global south and just how much like meddling in elections we do in other countries. And it's it's really a daunting thing for people to learn. But just be kind with people, be generous and try to educate and always talk from a position of good faith. The The worst thing we can do is try to exploit people's like when they're going through a, a really hard time and you're like, Hey, I know someone just died, but like, let me tell you, that's exactly why we need Medicare for all. Like sometimes that's not very tactful and that's a, a really quick way to piss someone off and, and to not have them be receptive. I see Greg has, has joined the queue a couple times. I really want to make sure he gets a chance to speak. So Greg, let's get him in here. Greg, yourself. you're up. I'd love to hear what you have to say. You hear me? Yep. Yeah. We you're in. You. Yo, what's up guys? Yeah. No, uh, just to go off, uh, what Ryan said about the media, uh, we have a huge education problem in this country, or at least like um, in terms of what people are being told. I mean, in, at least in my experience, we have such a tight dichotomy between the red and blue. It's like you you start talking about student loan forgiveness on one side, they call you a communist. On the other side, if you're against mandates, then all of a sudden you're a Trump or a Republican. Um, there's no, there's, there's this very fine line where we can't, where it, it seems like we just can't organize on the issues that we both agree with simply because of labels. Like we're just yep. calling each other names and then deciding that it's, that's where their politics lies. Um, but yeah, no, I just, uh, I, I want to know if there if there's if there's anything that because we have several parties in Europe. What what's realistically stopping a third party and in, in from in the U.S. and do you see any sort of chance? Considering we have fifty percent of uh, voters who are willing to vote independent if it's Trump versus Biden again. So clearly. Yeah. Yeah, cl clearly answer. there's there's like there's some kind of storm brewing where people people are starting to get it, people are starting to understand. But again, like you said, with this with with the media and our failure of an education system, people are just thinking that red, it, it, you're, you you toe the line between red and blue constantly but to just and meanwhile it politics just doesn't work like that people have different issues and they stand on different things depending on like it's not there's no like fine line it's 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 more of like a dot map yeah i think the interesting thing is third parties don't win because they're told they're not viable and so people don't vote for them because they're told they're not viable and then they never become viable because they're always just told, well, they're never going to win. So they're always going to use that as an excuse of, well, third party candidates can't win. They've won some elections, whether it's mayoral races, local levels. Yes, but we're still looking for a big breakthrough from like independence and the Green Party um, to to really win some key battles for Senate seats or for the House of Representatives or even meeting certain thresholds in the presidential election. And until they start being seen as like viable, people won't vote for them. But again, you can't get them to be viable without people voting for them. And people don't want to vote for someone they know is going to lose. And if they're constantly told, well, that team is never going to win. It's always red or blue. You're, you're just wasting your vote. 
it does unfortunately make a lot of people say, well, it just, it can't be realistic. And then it continues this, this cycle that just fuels itself into entrenching the two parties as like the only two choices. And people are tired of having to make a lesser of two evils vote every single exactly. time. Even just in France, I saw that they, pe- uh, they pulled a bunch of people and like 91% of people that voted for Macron they didn't do it because they liked his policies. They were voting against Le Pen, right? And so this this ideology that in in American politics we see it constantly. I don't know how many people voted for Joe Biden and how many people voted against Trump, but I would say the vast majority were voting against Trump. And so if if we keep having these elections decided not by who we want to win, but who we think has the best chance of stopping the other person that's just so much worse, that's that's kind of getting us in this situation where you know, where, yeah, you got Joe Biden, it's not Trump, but like, we have more kids in cages at the border, we have more money for war and police and and military. It's just, it's like, at a certain point, people need to kind of realize that it's better to vote for something and not get it than vote for something you don't want and get it. So that's, that's kind of my philosophy on it. But I'd love to hear what India has to say about it. Yeah, I I only bring this up. I mean, I this is just another example. I mean, there's uh this person Zoe in live chat saying uh, talking about constant compromise. The idea of compromise in our elections is pretty much what's ruining any chance of actual change. Yeah, I, I see what what Zoe is saying too. The only thing I would say is is that this is the message that Democrats have have been parroting to to me since I started voting. Uh, and I've now been voting for almost 20 years is, is that is to compromise. But when you compromise with Democrats, like you don't get anything. It's not like Democrats are ever meeting us halfway, like literally compromising with the corporate Democrats gets us nothing. And I think like what you said, uh, um, Greg, I think is so important, like that, that there's so many issues that we do agree with, but they try to divide us, you know, between blue and red. Look, I believe in dignity and justice for all people all people. And I understand that that means that there are some people who the system has been pushing down on even more. Uh, and so they're going to, it's going to require us to do more to, to, to lift them up. But the idea is if you want to organize around delivering dignity and justice for all people, that means that like you got it, that means you have to try to reach everyone and you have to, you can't just be like, Oh no, you, you, you voted red in the past. Sorry. Like you're out of here. Or like you voted for this person in 2008. That means you're a racist, you know, like you, we have, if you want to have a world where everyone, or an economy that works for everyone, then you got to uh, reach everyone. And, you, and you've got to work to bring people together. I think the one hope I see is, is what Indy said earlier, is there was a poll recently, and 58% of voters uh, in the poll, it was a Gallup poll, and they said if the choice is Biden or Trump in 2024, that they will consider an independent candidate. Now, 58% is a majority. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the majority of the public is tired of both of these ruling class parties. The majority of the public, despite the fact that we have everything going against us, against us, despite the fact that the media is owned by corporations and indoctrinating us with fear and telling us to vote for these corrupt corporate candidates, despite the fact, you know, that, that the that uh, despite Citizens United and the the fact that uh, corporations can give unlimited amounts of contributions to candidates and political parties, you know, despite the fact that we have all this going against us, the people still understand that the system isn't working. So the reason kind of the Democrats are panicking right now and and, and spouting all these promises that they're not going to fulfill, uh, the reason Republicans are panicking is because they understand that the people aren't buying the bullshit that they're selling anymore because people are struggling no matter which party's in power. I've talked with a lot of people who literally believed Joe Biden was going to cancel some student loan debt or literally believed Joe Biden was going to fight for a public option and going to fight for a $15 uh, living wage. Uh, that's not even the living wage anymore. That's just a minimum wage. A living wage would be you know 24 to $30. But they're seeing now that like Biden's not doing any of that. So people are growing more disenfranchised every day. That's the moment to tell them not to give up to tell them that we need to fight for something better and and to keep organizing. Like I voted for the Greens in uh, in 2020 in the general. I voted for Bernie in the primary before he got screwed over again. Uh, But in the general, I voted for the Greens. And, you know, they tell us that like voting for a third party is a wasted vote. 
But in my opinion, what's a wasted vote is voting for either of these corrupt corporate parties that you know will not serve you and that will just continue to serve their donors. Like they say, oh, what if the, the third party loses? Like who's winning these elections that we're having in America? Because every time from what I, from what I can see is the people lose every election when the Democrats or Republicans win and the billionaire class and the giant corporations, they're the ones who are really winning these elections. So, you know, of course, there's going to be liberals who are just lifelong Democrats who don't want to hear any of this and want to just continue to shame voters. And, you know, look at the look at the campaign that, that liberals are doing right now that they did in 2020. They were literally I had people harassing me. There were people posting pictures of my boyfriend's home on the Internet. There were people that were harassing our black and brown comrades that were voting third party. Literally, if you tell uh, an obedient Democrat that you're going to vote for what you want and vote for the Green Party or vote for so a, a socialist party, they will literally shame and harass you. What does that say about them? That doesn't say anything about me. I'm fighting and voting for what I want. It says that they lack the courage of their convictions to fight for what they actually want. So but wait, Ryan, you live, like you, li you, you live in the blue dignity and justice. You live in you the bluest state in the country. Are unpopular. I live in I lived in California. We've since moved, but it doesn't matter to these people. They think that the, the reason and here here's the other crux. The reason the Democrats aren't doing anything for the people is because everyone just keeps giving them their votes and, and, and expecting nothing in return. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you that if instead of liberals harassing voters right now online, instead, liberals were pushing Biden, pushing Pelosi, challenging their party to do better. If the if the pundits on CNN and MSNBC, instead of hating on socialists and hating on the left, if they were actually pushing Joe Biden and holding his feet to the fire, I guarantee you we'd be a lot closer to, to getting some legislation that actually benefits everyday people. But that's not what's happening. The reason the Democrats continue to just spout empty platitudes and then govern for Wall Street and govern for their corporate donors is because because. They, because we allow people allow them to take their votes for granted. They feel entitled to our votes. So if these Democrats are like, well, we can just give nice speeches. We can weaponize identity politics. We can put someone like Obama or now it's going to be Pete Buttigieg or Kamala Harris. And, and, and they continue to deceive people. And the thing I always say, even as like as, as a gay man, like progress is not putting one marginalized person in a position of power and then just pretending like everything is better. Real progress is actually improving the conditions of all marginalized people, right? Actually improving conditions for the working class and for black and brown and LGBTQ people. But that's not what the Democrats do, right? They just want to elevate one person into a position of power and act like, oh, everything's better now. Like, no, everything's not better now because you guys are now in, in charge of our corrupt capitalist and imperialist system. You're, you're, you're in charge of the same system Trump was in charge of, and you're doing the same things Trump was doing. And so... That to me is just so evident right now that like for four years, Democrats resisted a president who was putting kids in cages, who was expanding oil drilling and, you know, who was increasing the military budget. And now Democrats are wholeheartedly supporting a president who is still putting kids in cages, who is still expanding oil drilling and who is increasing our military and police budgets even further. If that doesn't tell you that the Democrats are just not who they say they are and are deceiving us, I don't know what will. And so it's time to keep fighting. It's time to look for other things. Right now, I, you know, I still support the Green Party. I support Socialist Alternative. They are a socialist party that's building power. They've had some success in Seattle uh, with Shama Savant. Um, I know PSL's running candidates. Um, you know, I'll support any independent party uh, or anyone who's building a, any direct action or movements outside of the corporate party. Uh, I just think that wasting any more time, energy and resources on trying to reform a party that is telling us loudly and clearly who and what it is. The Democrats are telling us that they're a corporate party. They're telling us they don't want to be a left party. They don't want to be a progressive party. They want to continue to just govern for comfortable liberals and govern for people who the status quo uh, is okay for. Well, guess what? There's millions of people now that the status quo is killing and we can't accept this anymore. And so that's why I think, look, it, as, as hard as it's going to be, I feel hope when I see polls that 58% of people will vote for an independent candidate. You know, the system isn't working. 
it, it's working for who it was intended to work for, which is the is the ruling class. And so because of that, it gives us an opportunity to reach out to people. And like Rob said, focus on education, focus on um, giving people hope when they don't feel any. And, and I want to turn back to Indy uh, and, and let you get a chance here to talk about because you do a lot of great work, Indy. You kind of uh, put all the left uh, media together on one website. And I think, you know, look, with what we've talked about today, uh, with our news media and political parties being corporately owned and controlled, I think that independent media and independent movements are some of the most important tools that we can use to fight back against this corporate power. So, Andy, do you want to talk about uh, some of the work that you do with the independent left news? Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So for the last two years plus, uh, I've been aggregating and finding independent sources that are free from corporate influence and free from corporate control and free of State Department narrative and and talking points that are challenging the establishment, that are anti-imperialist, that are socialist. And I've al- I also support Socialist Alternative. They put out a, a great publication. PSL does stuff through popular resistance. And all of that is aggregated at, at daily at independentleft.news. We also pull in YouTube uh, videos from over a hundred channels out there so that you can, again, go to one. I couldn't find one central place to read all these amazing articles from the gray zone and from common dreams and from truth out and consortium news and, and popular information and all the uh, mint press news, outstanding publication. They got censored today from PayPal. Um, and so where, where can you find all these in one place? I built that. That's called independentleft.news. And then we have a substack called leftist.today. Do some YouTube shows where we talk about some of the news stories that we cover uh, every Sunday night on our YouTube channel called How Did We Miss That? I do that with uh, the guy sitting next in chat named Reef. He's my co-host. Um, Let's bring him and, in. Uh, He's been waiting for a while. Let's bring in Reef. Reef. There he is. So, and that, and then we're also members for the INN Indie News Network, which we founded this year uh, or late last year. We're about to, to hit our six month anniversary. Twenty yep. different channels and independent content creators. And welcome, Reef. What's up, man? What's up? Well, you I, well, I wanted to I wanted to bring up. You know, we 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 talk about this a lot on on how do we miss that? Um, but the the giant shift to uh, direct action which I've not seen more vitriol from the quote unquote left, right. than when uh, parties do these direct actions, especially against democratic, you know, um, like senators and congressmen, especially the squad, right. If it's going against any of those things, we get more pushback at that, which tells me that's the thing we should all be doing anyway. You know, we, we talk to a ton of people and they almost all of them feel that electoralism in some way is not worth our effort right now when we can't get the politicians that we have elected to do what we need them to do. Uh, so, you know, stopping the funding to those parties, you know, and pushing it to direct action and mutual aid, you know, for people to weather the storm that is coming, you know, it, it's that's that's what me and Indy have been focused on and you know uh, a bunch of others in the space who are paying attention are also focused on and to build so, independent media independent networks uh, yeah. doing it through substack and through blogging and through <clears throat> having websites that aggregate and pull in and, and identify the independent channels that are uh, uncorrupted and are free from the six companies that Ryan you talked about earlier that control ninety plus percent of what everybody sees the things. I think it's more about twenty because you've got Amazon and you've got Apple and you've got some of the other ones now that are playing Netflix. But the six corporations own the own the networks um, and and the cable companies. But now you've got the OTT uh, uh, players, so you've got about fifteen right. to twenty companies that really control that. And and again. We have to play outside those those companies and anyone who works for those and is talking inside the that that sphere is a is is a servant of that system because they wouldn't get where they were unless they were serving the system. Even the ones yep. that that are loud and look like they're countering the system are not really countering the system. They're being allowed and controlled inside that system to yell and have a voice to allow right. for the discourse. There's co-option everywhere. If you're not paying attention, it's going to happen. Like, well, we can you know, see the co-option in real time when the you know the progressive members we elected, they're not even talking about or fighting for the policies that they once campaigned on, and then when they yeah. actually had a chance to 
challenge Pelosi and, and get something for voting for her for speaker, they folded completely. And it's like, where, mm-hmm. where are the people who ran campaigns that like, we're going to fight, we're going to take on the establishment. Like we're going to fight back against the establishment. When does the fighting begin? Because all they've done is fold. It's been a complete fold into the system. And you're right. The system is never going. Why would these corrupt parties that use our government to enrich themselves, enrich their donors, why would they ever reform the very system that they're getting rich off of? Right? They still like, tell when, us we need unification. Yeah. And We're still you, on that. Yeah, and thank you guys for talking about direct action and for doing direct action. One of the uh, one of the people that I that I really, we had on the show a few weeks ago, but was Rome, Unholy Rome, mm. who's with the Revolutionary Blackout Network. And they just, yeah. they, you know, he's doing his tour for the poor. He was just in Boston delivering tents. He and, literally gets know, the shoes off his feet. Yeah. And it's like the thing for me is like, why should we be why should we continue to fund these politicians uh, and and give, you know, something Bernie and AOC and all them? We gave them one hundred and twenty seven million dollars over the last six years. Someone calculated it. Think of what that money could have done for our communities, for the very marginalized people that they're saying they're going to represent. Like people are struggling out there. You know, we could use that money to actually help people, give them a warm meal, give them you know, uh, clothes and food. And, and it's and, not like the people don't want those things. Like, uh, you yeah. know, we, we're, we're told all the time that we can't do stuff because the Republicans are good. I live in the deplorable countries, you know, like I'm, I'm out here with them. Like they come to my dinner table, you know, it, if you and don't attach the label to those policies. And are they just as fed up with the system as you are? Abs- and, and I absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And they all like, say yeah. fuck Joe Biden. Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the first thing, you know, yeah. and, and luckily because I voted third party, I, I get to go. Yeah, I didn't vote for him either. You know, yep. so I have had so many Republicans send me a private message. They don't do this publicly because they're too embarrassed. Mm-hmm. And, and this is over the last six months, especially they'll be like, I cannot believe how many of your tweets I I. I relate to. Yep. And one guy recently is like, I wanted to retweet it so bad, but then I was scared that like everyone in my network would see that you're a socialist. And they're like, well, see, why am I agreeing so much with a socialist? And I just wrote back, Indy, dude, because I believe Indy knows what I'm going to say justice. next. I believe in dignity and justice for all people. It's not that radical. Like right. you believe it too. I believe in an economy oh, yeah. that works for all of us. Like, I, so it's just these Republicans actually, we can get them to agree on a better world, agree on a world where we can, where, where everyone can have opportunity and have housing and healthcare, but you're not going to get there if you're continuing to divide and continuing to say, Oh, can't bring you in our coalition. You voted for a Republican in 1992. Like, like again, the way the, oligarchy has power the way these parties have power is divide divide and conquer so anyone who wants to build a coalition you cannot be in the business of dividing you have to want to welcome everyone and so i just i have the hardest time with liberals i'm working on it because i used to be a liberal but when they harass me for choosing to fight for something better to choosing to do what their party refuses which is to actually look for solutions and policies that will benefit all people i'm sorry like i can't go along with that anymore well they're so focused on Political identity, you know, uh, right. how many times, Indy, do I have to say that labels are bad? If you don't put labels on things and you just have it as a policy, how many how many marches are we seeing on just singular issues now, right? These decentralized movements on issue-based things, not figureheads, not heroes that we still want to worship, right. like just issues. And if you continue to do that, stuff will get done. You know, even right now with the ALU, AOC has to save face and go out there, right? You know, uh, so, and even that we're worried about co-option. Yep. But look, when Chris Smalls went on Fox News and talked to Tucker Carlson, he was such a great messenger. It was amazing. We just want that same. Unionizing and talking about, you know, a working class message. And there were literally liberals who were like, oh, he shouldn't go on Fox News. Right. And then when we Ridiculous. say, how, how many times, Ryan, are you told, especially when any of our, you know, friends go on Tucker to voice their message to half of the American public, right? You know, that you have to be aware that Tucker has a message that he's trying to put out there and you got to be aware of the spin he's trying to do. You need to be able to do the same thing regardless of network. Yep. When you go on MSNBC, CNN, how are they spinning your story? What are they doing? 
And what does it you say know. about MSNBC and CNN that they won't even have a, a free speech advocate on their network? No. They or have you bring on. someone on to talk? Or have you on? Or have any How of us have on? Have you on, yeah. Ryan? Never. They never would. Capable. Of course right. not. No, because you're not approved by the corporate narrative. That's exactly. Well, and they the know way. if they gave you the mic for five minutes, you'd blow up everything. They all would. No, they wouldn't. They they will not allow an independent minded socialist on their. No, never, never. Especially one who's done with playing nice. They definitely won't do that. No, you know, because they they're they're in the business of controlling people. You know, right. The media is in the business of controlling people. The Democratic Party, you know, that was really one of my biggest epiphanies is they don't want progress. They want obedience. Yes. They're in the business of controlling the people, telling the people, no, 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 that's too, you can't, you can't have health care. You can't, I mean, they thought right. Bernie was extreme. Bernie's a moderate in any other country. There's right. nothing he's, extreme about what he's Bernie had those kid, for. kid glove mittens but, on yeah, since 2016. Like, yeah. And, the, and the, the crazy corrupt oligarchs in the Democratic Party and the Hillary's of the world tried to paint him as the most radical extreme person. He's nothing. He is so innocent. I mean, he's like fighting for like just basic reforms that would like right. that would literally not even do and, away with our capital. It's almost system. lip service from him anymore. Like, I, like and, yeah, and he like, plans so on running exactly, again. Like, please. I uh, you how far to the right the system is, like Rob said earlier. I mean, he was yeah. caught on when he said that. It's just it's it's purely driven by corporate interests. Anything right. that's about the people's interests is silenced, is pushed down. And any messages you do hear are ones to divide us. Again, they right. divide and conquer. They don't want us coming together. That's their yeah. fear, is all of us coming together because then we have some real power. Well, it's, it's the same thing as always, the same thing we're yelling in 2016. It's like, hey, you want to unify? There's a big line behind us. Yep. You know, like uh, if uh, we, we, we've talked about Christian Spalls on our on INN News for the, like the last three weeks. Partially because it's like we we see it as one of the only like shots at power we've had in a long time. Absolutely, you know? it's kind of the one bright spot. Like Democrats right. aren't giving us anything, but this this resurgence of the labor movement is definitely right. the one bright spot we see. Right and we now. have we have no problem with Smalls. We we love him to death that he was able to do this. He, he did it without them. I would like him to continue to do it without them. Agreed. They don't deserve it. None of them do. This is just photo ops. And, it should also be you know, political and nonpartisan. That's my yes. contention. The minute you uh, make it partisan, it should be, you turn it should off be about the, the workers. Con- you, you turn off one of our, That's right. Yeah, it should be it's one of our workers, INN members. About their conditions, period, yeah. and about their retirement. And their one of our family. INN members, Chris Legion, you know, talks about this all the time, that this is one of the ways that they will try to ruin your union, right? That they will attach you to political candidacies, right? Uh, just as as guilt by association, because now all those all those right wingers in Long Island, right, who don't like AOC and Bernie, might get turned off now because you had them show up, or or you know you're you're hanging around with people who who pushed Kamala Harris and you know Hillary Clinton, you're you're hanging around with them, Dolores Ford. you know you're getting designer clothes that say "Eat the Rich" on it, like. Great. I, I love that you're going to get attention. You know what would get more attention? Doing something, which you have been doing. Yeah. And this, they're con- keeping winning, you from doing it. Yeah, and winning a contract, which is what they're working towards. You know, and right. really kind of now using their power for the workers and to actually yeah. get them a better contract, get them better wages, better well, benefits. That really is, is what is how you can see it turn. But you're absolutely right. We, we have to be weary that co from the dawn of time, the capitalists love to co-opt movements. I mean, that's literally what the CIA does, right? Is, is mm-hmm. co-opt and infiltrate uh, revolutionary movements in this country. They, they, you know, that's their job. I mean, they, they are very smart at it. That is why we have the system we have. That is why we have record levels of inequality, because they've, they've waged a smear campaign against yep. socialism, against anything that benefits the working class we've in seen this it, country for the last We've seen years. The, the new McCarthyism uh, yep. blossom since 2016. Bernie Sanders famously Russiagated himself, right? We're still yep. We're still trying to have people figure that out, and especially with this whole blue and yellow conflict we've been having that people are still divided on. Right. Even though in, in, in the circles we're in, it's, it's pretty obvious what's happening yep. right now. You know, uh, Moppin and others are being pulled from PayPal. Right. Uh, you know, uh, 
Well, the U.S. RTs. Empire is really the, the thing is about the U.S. Empire is they're not right. doing themselves any favors when they start censoring no. uh, anti-imperialist voices or any no. voice that's like, wait a second, what's really going on here? Just asking questions. Why are we sending billions of dollars of weaponry into a war zone? Why isn't Joe Biden on TV every day using the biggest right. bully pulpit in the world and advocating for peace? Why are we, and pushing why are we for still trying talks? to extradite Assange? Why are yes, we still trying to like, do that? Exactly. This is and, and just asking those questions gets right. independent media kicked off of platforms. And, and yeah. people are smart. They're like, OK, so the empire doesn't want anyone even challenging their narratives about this war. They want. And that's really, for me, the sad part. I mean, from the beginning, well, the war happened. I put out a tweet and I just said very simply, I stand in solidarity with the working class, with 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 working class people in Russia, Ukraine and in every corner of this earth. Who yeah. Deserve to live in peace, but do not. Because we live under an economy that that hits us against each other in order to benefit the ruling class. And that's really yeah. what I see happening here mm -hmm. is this is just mm -hmm. another instance where the, America is pumping in weapons. Like if you want to stop a war, do you pump in thirty three billion dollars worth of weapons or do you get on TV and you and push for peace talks? It's really simple to me. You push for peace yeah. talks. You do everything mm -hmm. possible to pressure to bring Putin to the table, to bring them to the table. Right. But that's mm -hmm. not what NATO wants. That's not what the U.S. wants. No, they want to we're sending this military aid still. For as long as and we're possible. sanctioning the Russian people. And you which, know who's right. collateral right. damage? Right. Who's collateral damage are the Ukrainians who are caught in. The yes. Peace. Uh, especially the ones in the Donbass. Yeah, we're using Ukraine to, to fight this proxy war against Russia. It's very mm -hmm. simple to me. But no, I mean, if you say Same this, thing we've done in every other conflict for the last, like, uh, yeah. multiple decades. Uh, Desert Storm, Gulf War, like, yep. we've been... And now all we've of a sudden been... we're supposed to believe the U.S. Empire is... is, is, is you know, is is, is oh. on the good side of this and wants what's best for the Ukrainian people. Like, no, this is what we're bringing democracy. That's always their word. You know, whenever the United States is bringing uh, oligarchy and imperialism and capitalism to the world, they, they, they say, oh, no, we're bringing democracy. Well, I fell for that for many years, but I'm not falling for that anymore. I mean, it's well, I mean, come on. Right I now, it's especially sinister that like Joe Biden decades ago was literally saying that, you know, putting a NATO, having Ukraine join NATO would be a red line crossing over a red line and would provoke military response from Russia. And then you. we also find out the State Department saying, well, actually, we were never actually going to have Ukraine be an actual member of NATO. Like they came out and said they, they told them the they told he knew. When I so first you, read that headline, I thought that was like they had just told him. No, they had told him from the beginning that the doors will publicly be open. Their public position is that it will be open, but privately, you're not getting in. Yeah. And, and so I what are we doing? The United what? States, instead of pushing for more diplomacy, instead of pushing for de-escalation. Russia has one demand. Fine. They were very fine throwing Ukraine into the fire, knowing right. that yep. the, the damage wasn't going to be to American soldiers, knowing that this was just going to be another, another, uh, uh, and it's going to be another Afghanistan is, where is they the, basically yeah. say proxy war. We're trying to bleed the Russians. And again, it, like I can say this, say Putin is a bad guy. He's an anti-communist, but like at the same time, let's look at actually the historical, not even just going back to the coup in 2014, going back to like the dissolution of the Soviet Union. There have the been 90s. so many signs that the that Russia was like, hey, we don't want to have these members as part of, uh, quote, defensive ally alliance that like right. once the Warsaw Pact was yes. no longer, disbanded, the Minsk Agreement we get to, right. Out yep. the door as well. And the fact well, that like. The U.S. just uses Ukraine and Ukrainian citizens are, are going to be the ones paying a lot of the bloodshed. It's just it's not it's not right. And the fact that it's it's all political and the regular and, people of, of countries in Europe and America who are having to pay increased costs just to, like, get to their fucking uh, to their jobs, not because crude oil prices have gone up, but because we allow in this country multinational uh, oil companies to just jack up the prices for no fucking reason and then even in europe where they're saying like you know we were going to have the nord stream 2 pipeline and now yeah. all of a sudden germany's like well our our energy just got a lot more expensive so the everyday people will suffer and a large part of it is because the united states was like yeah we're willing to fuck everyone else over so we can have a proxy war uh with the, the well and you have so-called 
Germany ahead. also just Germany also is about to buy a hundred billion dollars worth of new weaponry. So not only are they increasing their gas costs, they're now starting to militarize again. And we're allowing that. Right. To have... Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I got well, you know, sorry, I, guys. I, saying... I gotta I gotta run. I got I got kids. This has been great. Ryan, thank you so much. What an honor, really. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll be back hopefully soon. We'll I'll absolutely, we'll Indy. All more. the thanks to you, and I encourage everyone to go to uh, independent. What is it? Independent dot left news. Independent left dot news. Or independent left dot news. Or independent and I'll put the Either and one. I'll put the links um, when I when I share this to Twitter. I'm going to put the link to your website because again, oh, I, thank you for. Thank you for all the work you do. I, I mean, you. I go to your website because I know I can see clips from from all the people who I uh, actually trust, and I know I'm not getting news that is, you know, that is corporate, that is that that has an agenda. That these are just everyday people who who literally sat. I mean, literally just sacrifice their time, energy, and effort to to try to get the American people and the people of this world a little bit closer to the truth. And so, yeah. uh, no, I really thank you, Indy, for what you're doing. All right, have a great day, guys. Guys, thank you. Well, and, yep. and speaking of, of independent media, we, we, we've got a, a not so independent, what used to be progressive, you know, not so youthful Turkish host saying to go fight right now. Who's not paid attention to any of the, like, someone who, who at some point said he was anti war. You know, I know exactly who you're talking about. And that, well, yeah. to me, the thing that's wild is, first off, the United States has succeeded in trying to paint. China and Russia is like these evil villains. When mm-hmm. if you just step back and look at it, who, which country in this world has 800 plus bases throughout yeah. this, throughout the world? Is it China or Russia who has 800 bases, military bases, or is it the United States? You know, well, I think what since you're seeing... World War II, which has been the nation who has, you, you know, who has uh, overthrown other countries, who has supported violent coups, who has engaged in, in these endless wars to you know, basically hoard other nations' resources. I mean, it's been us. We are yeah. we are the empire. Like, right. so I, we've we've cooed. Not, we've we yeah, we've we gave to weapons ask for drugs of our government for us to not to be asked why are you continuing this war? Why Joe Biden, when you will not do anything for the American people, should we give thirty three billion dollars worth of more weapons? Like, and and but the, you know, look, the establishment is very good at crafting their narratives. Look at how long it took them to get every liberal in America to change their Facebook and Twitter picture to yep. a, a yellow and blue flag and just all in with this war. This war it doesn't matter if this leads to nuclear war. Doesn't matter if if the consent they've just manufactured jumping, has yeah, been incredible. Them, cut them any amount of checks. Keep sending billions of dollars of weapons in there. We, can, you know, that to me is crazy. That they yeah. they literally this is like the CIA's dream. They have been able to manufacture consent and get the majority of the liberals in this country to support another war and, and to and to believe that it's for democracy. Look. The reason the Russian oligarchy exists in the first place, and this is where I would challenge people to go back to, watch the, watch the documentary Ukraine Under Fire that mm-hmm. is about the 2014 coup that Obama and, and our government supported. That's where a lot of this controversy with Russia really comes in, because Russia has been telling us for the last two decades to stop advancing NATO to its border, that, 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 and, and we've been doing the exact opposite. But before this coup happened in 2014, what happened in the 90s when when the, when the wall came down, when commu- when when it was yeah. when communism was replaced? What happened? It was it was literally people in the Clinton administration. It was a Harvard economics professor then went over there and helped the Russians implement the, the Russian government implement what they have as the oligarchy. Capitalism. Today. So, yeah. yes. So it's like we, America. This is what we do. Not only do we have the biggest oligarchy in the world and not only do we do we operate at home by exploiting the labor of the working class. We also yeah. go and teach other countries how to exploit the working class in their countries. I, I so have right wingers forever oligarchy in Russia is because we taught them how to implement the system. And you can right. go research all of this. So I just find it so interesting now that. That Democrats think every problem in America and every problem in the world is the result of Russian oligarchs when, yes, Russian oligarchs are bad and they exist. But guess where the most oligarchs and the biggest oligarchy is in the world? It's Mm -hmm. right here in the United States of America. And it's not the Russian oligarchs that are responsible for the corporate greed that is giving you a a lower paycheck and is raising your gas prices and is preventing you from having health care. It's the American oligarchs and the two parties 
parties they control. And so it's just so interesting to me how the ruling class in America has, has been able to get the people to buy in to, oh no, the boogeyman's China, the boogeyman's Russia, while they continue to pick our pockets and, yeah. and basically rig, keep the system rigged against us. And well, keep I think us what divided. you're seeing is, is, you know, all the conspiracy theorists in the world have latched onto this new world order thing, but not really knowing what that means, right? The, the new world order is that people are tired of America, uh, you know, uh, injecting its foreign policy beliefs into the rest of the world. You know, we, we continue to control other governments. We continue to, you know, rule with an economic fist. Right now we're trying to Im- imply sanctions on the Russian people, Right. As well as multiple other well, countries. Well, how let about alone... we haven't mentioned the sanctions that were imposing on Afghanistan? Afghanistan last week was reported that more people could die from the sanctions that Biden has implemented and we... than died in the two decade right. war in Afghanistan. There's twenty two point eight million Afghans right now who are facing acute starvation because of the United States sanctions. So not only did we go into their country, invade and rob them dry, but then we left and and basically rob them even more and place sanctions on them and now yeah. the people are are and, and Russia's essentially Afghans. going like yeah you want to do that here's here's my economic warfare how about we make everyone pay in rubles how about that you know and it's just a tit for tat situation with these two nuclear powers that we don't need in our lives at all right you know especially when we know how to fix it there's one demand that needs to be met and 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 what are we doing now? We're 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 trying to manufacture consent through. We've had how how many years of Russia Gate to make them our boogeyman again? Yep. Right. You know, it, to me, it's 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 basic basic stuff, basic stuff. We have the gall to 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 wheel out Condoleezza Rice to talk about war crimes when what's happening in Palestine right now? Everybody, anyone want to take a guess at what's happening there? Or in Yemen, or in Somalia, or in pick pick a country that we're involved more, in. More war crimes, right? More. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've been reading a, a couple of things. There was one from uh, I think it was Hedges, and I might be completely wrong. Uh, my, uh, no, R- Richard Wolf, right? That um, laid out. I mean, almost like went through the entire historical context of every war, not just these. Right. And people should go find that and read it because it's really enlightening on the subject. But, um, you know, uh, we're, we're still in, fighting stuff in Palestine. We're still trying to pay for the petrodollar. Like, uh, you know, it's uh, you get tired of seeing the same stuff that we've seen for the last decades. Yeah. And I think the you know, people, the good news is people are starting to wake up. They're not, yeah. you know, it's really hard to blame Putin's price hike for, for the problem when like your party has the levers of power. Uh, you know, Putin, I always say, but Putin didn't write the laws in America that are rigged uh, for yeah. corporations and billionaires. The, the U.S. politicians wrote those laws. Right. That, yeah. that are rigged for for the billionaire class and for corporations. So I think that people are not buying the narratives anymore. I think less and less are. And that's a good thing. And I think that yeah. at the end of the day, I do think that the people are tired of being divided. I think we want a better system. I think people want to live in a world where they can they can earn a decent living. They can pr- keep their family safe and they can be happy. You know, I think so many people I see we're so disconnected from each other. We're, we're our purpose is is what to just basically survive under the grip of this oppressive right. empire. And, and I feel like people are lacking true purpose. We're la- we're we're lacking connection. And, and I think that's what a movement that brings us together. And and that's look the, as much as Bernie breaks my heart today. Like mm-hmm. I credit Bernie for my political awakening. If it wasn't for Bernie, I yeah. probably would have just remained kind of you know. Okay, I'll just vote for a Democrat because they're they're all like that's all I can do. But no, like yeah. now I'm going to fight. I'm going to do everything I can to fight for something better. And I'm not going to settle for the status quo anymore. I'm not going to buy the narratives they tell us for why we can't have you know a better life and a better quality of life here. And I think right. the more people that the more people that realize that the that that's how the movement just keeps growing. And it, it I do believe that better things are on the horizon. I think that. We're in a moment now where I just don't think the system, I think they're trying to do the best they can. Right now, the Democrats are basically like, what's the minimum amount we can do to keep the people from grabbing pitchforks and, and yeah. storming the castle? Which and, is what they've always done. 
Yes, which is what they've always done. But what's happening is right now, there's just, they're, they're giving less and less. The crumb is so small. Remember, they yeah. said they were going to give us $2,000 checks. Well, they only gave us $1,400 checks. You know, they said a public option. There's no public option. They said, you know, a living wage. There's no living wage. You know, right. so they've broken promise after promise that I think that now we're at a point, especially with the younger generation who doesn't watch corporate media, who gets their news from different sources, where I think we have a better chance than ever to, to, to kind of build the world that we want to see. Uh, but again, it's going to take work and, it, and, and, and it's going to take trust and it's going to take us turning to each other, not turning against each other. That's right. really what the parties want. They want us to be fighting each other when we need to be coming together and, 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 and keeping our um, criticism and our fight and uh, against the ruling class. Focus on issues. Yeah, and issues like the, that improve yeah. our lives. Focus, that movement has to be on issues, right? Agreed. You know, the, the reason why politicians, Policies the reason why the politics. movement in the 60s and, and 50s and they focused on an issue and everyone could agree on that issue. It's yep. harder. It's harder to do it that way. Much people are more willing to follow a figurehead into battle, but but it's harder to, to follow an ideal if the movement fights for policies, right? Right. And if it's on ideals, absolutely. You know, and, and I think part of the reason that it's been so hard to do that is is the constant manufacture of consent for everything terrible, the constant apologies for the people who have power who won't do anything. You know, there was there was a Vice documentary a, a minute ago. I'm I'm a big MMA nerd you know, forgive me of my, you know, sports sins, but, um, you know, there's, there's a people, there's a group of people and that people will know if they watch the, the Dagestanis. We're talking about Khabib, Nurmagomedov. We're talking about Bilal Muhammad. There's loads of them in that group, right? Um, they're all the, the, you know, from Dagestan, that mountain is part of Russia, which if we're going to invade, I, I want people to ask their permission first, first off, um, you know, you're going to need it because you're not going to get through them. But um, they talked about in this Vice documentary that there were um, neo-Nazi fight clubs that were in Ukraine that were keeping the Dagestanis out because they're technically brown Russians, right? They're, you know, Islamic, you know, followers and, like, really lovely people if anyone ever, you know, wants to look into their backgrounds and stuff. But, um you know, Khabib's out here with Che Guevara certs and stuff, so good guy. But, um, you know, the, it, Vice could call this out a, a year and change ago, right? That yep. this kind of stuff was happening and there it was were rampant. Articles, not just from and Vice. Was, there were the New York yep. Times, Time Magazine. Yep. There's a growing neo Nazi problem in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. you go back and look two, three years. There was article after article about the growing neo Nazi movement in Ukraine. Now, literally, if you if you if you share an article or if you bring this up, liberals are like, no, there's no not no, no Nazis well, in Ukraine. Nina it's, Nina Turner is out here in blue and yellow, right? While also not supporting BDS, right? And we're supposed to just flock to her and and go vote in droves to get her. The squad doesn't even want you, unfortunately. Well, that that's what broke my heart. I mean, I love Nina. I've worked with Nina um, yeah. a year ago when I was trying to help build the People's Party, which I'm no longer affiliated with. But I, I mean, again, I support any movement that is yep. trying to build power for the people. But, you know, when you have the Progressive Caucus come out and say and endorse her opponent, who is a corporatist uh, Democrat right. and is never going to support any policy that, that we need to bring dignity and justice to all people in this country. You literally have Jam Pramila Jayapal and the Progressive Caucus endorsing Nina's opponent. It's like the, the, the Democrats don't even want you. Like, why don't you right. use your why are you Why are you here and in, in the Dem Party? In, in solidarity and, and run independently. Run independently. I don't get why that's hard. And you know, if you want to say I'm a run in the primary, and then if that doesn't work, I'll run third. And, and honestly, the last thing I, that I really need to get through to people is tur I think that people need to turn off MSNBC and all these corporate media outlets because what Absolutely. they're not understanding is if you live in the corporate media world is – the majority of the people find both of these parties wildly unpopular. The Democratic Party is tarnished. The Republican Party's brand is tarnished. 
All they, these parties have are massive amounts of power and money from corporations and billionaires, but they don't have the people's respect because they keep letting the people down. So if you run as independent, I know it sounds scary. Don't... You're going to have more respect from the people. People are more inclined to support you because they don't like Democrats or Republicans. I can't stand both parties. But sometimes if you just get your news on corporate media and you watch the circus that they're trying to construct for us. It's like there's two worlds. The world that they're, the, that they're manufacturing, where the system is working and capitalism is great and imperialism is great and let's just keep voting for the status quo. You know, that's the world that CNN and MSNBC and Fox News sell every day. That right. world is failing the majority of the people in this country. And so if you run independently, if you actually fight for your convictions, people like that. People don't want Annette to vote for another Democrat. They just feel yeah. like, okay, well, there's nothing else. So it does disappoint me. I would love to see Nina have the courage to actually fight well, for what I feel I know like... she believes in. I've had I've been on had private conversations with Nina. I've had Nina on the show last year. I yeah. mean, I know what Nina's about. I just wish that I think sometimes there's like this thought that like, well, if I don't run as a Democrat, I can't win. And I would just push back and say, look, the people aren't winning anyways when Democrats right. win. No it's one's like, winning when either. Of it's these like with Smalls. Wins. Someone told him that you need to be nice to these people. Look what happened when you told AOC to like get the f out of here. She showed up, right? <laughs> well, right. Well, that. not just that, right? Which if she shows up, great. You don't even have to give her a mic. Appreciate your support. Yeah. You know. But like um, the only reason she showed up is because she was. Is because out. she, she got called out. out. No, absolutely. Yes. I mean, then, and like, all these things to me are like, I mean, IOUs anyway. You should. Year. I don't even on. bother trying to hold AOC accountable because I don't think she no. needs to be held accountable. But well, like, is... I remember like a year ago when I was like, let's I, I was a big part of the force the vote campaign. Like, let's try yeah. to at least hold her accountable when it yeah. was clear to me that like the Bernie movement broke in half. There was like the half that wanted to put politicians over the policies that we were fighting for. And, yeah. and for me, that is the same cult of personality that's on the right. Mm -hmm. who, like people on the right will defend Trump no matter what. There were people right. who were like, no, you can't ask for better from AOC. How dare you question AOC? How well, dare you hold her accountable? And that's what we're like, warning people. That's we're warning people cult. about that with Nina. We're that's warning people. That's the cult like movement that they have on both sides. I can't, and that, and that I can't trust them. And Obama supporters have. You're I mean, not supposed to me, trust them. No. Like that's like, not your job as a voter. They're meant to be held accountable. They're not Absolutely. meant to be worshipped. They're not celebrities. You know, like, and so for me, like when I saw that, I'm like, oh, we're in real trouble. Because the movement doesn't even want to hold. We know that DSA is not holding them accountable. DSA is yeah. using AOC to fundraise. AOC yeah. and the squad are like their biggest fundraisers. So I'm like, DSA is not holding them accountable. Justice Democrats, they're not holding them accountable. I'm like, no. the only mechanism we have are the people. And then when yeah. we would try to just wage a little campaign to hold them accountable. Yeah, we or a march or enough. whatever. I was right. literally called every name in the book simply for demanding better from AOC. And so yeah. you see this, though, through everyone in America who who needs to belong to a political party and they yeah. need to like there's the you know the centrists think obama is the savior the I, conservatives I can tell you what it is. is the savior and then the progressives think first it was bernie now it's aoc no no one's coming to save us we have to save ourselves the people have to lead the movement we have to be accountable to each other and like you said we have to fight for policies yeah. we have to keep it based on policies and, and we have to invite everyone into the movement not being like oh you you voted for trump in 2016 so fuck you and you can never, you know, join a movement that's about dignity right. and justice for all people. Where is the where's the learning in that? Where's the growing in that? You're not going to allow people to grow and change. How can our country grow and change if you're not going to allow the millions of people that live here to grow and change? And that's really Davis the problem with this woke talks about it. He's it's one like of the few people, people I know they're woke, but they're not woke because right. they're just trying to be morally superior to everyone else. Absolutely, okay, you're morally superior to these Trump supporters. Good. Now what? Yeah. Do you want to actually fight to do something to help people? Do you want to fight for policies that will improve? No. They just want to feel morally better than everyone. It's like well, this, this elitism. It's disgusting. Well, and I, I live in a spot where the Klan still exists. It's still here. Like, Which it, is insane. Well, like me as, as, as a white Southern you know, guy with a beard, they'll, they'll hand you a flyer. You have to turn them down. You know, And, and Daryl Davis, who if you've not went and, and looked up any of his stuff, which you should, um, you know, he's one of the few people I know that have gotten people out of the Klan. And the way he talks about it is that it's about exposure. You have to expose people to a different form of thinking, to a different group of people, right? And and that's all it is. You just have to make people aware. It's The, the problem is awareness, you know? 
And, and the entire time you have people telling, telling us, Hey, don't make people aware of that, right? These people are nice people. I, I don't care if they're nice. I don't. I care what policies they want to enact and I want to know how they're going to do it. You know, Ryan, I've, I've asked multiple politicians running at this point, right? I've had the opportunity to interview a few of them. I have one question for them. How will you not be co-opted and corrupted? How will you keep in touch with the people? How will you, I get no answers. I get the same answer that AOC gave when she ran, that I'm going to be a one term, you know, uh, elected official. Well, that's and not I'm good gonna, enough for I, me. And I'm going to bring the heat on the establishment. And, and right. I get more done by, by being okay. you know, adversarial. Proud of you. I'll put your speech back. up on the refrigerator. But until then, I want you to give me a plan. At least tell the people in private, right? Like the people that actually care about the policies you want. Tell them what's happening. We want to help. What will be out in the streets for you. Right. It's the same thing. Why did Obama get rid of his entire army of people who were willing to go to bat for Medicare for all, for, you know, uh, ending the wars like, uh, you know, we're, we're still here. Those people are still out here. You know, it's just they've been listening to NPR now for too long that they, they can't see the forest through the trees. They, they've completely bought into whatever narrative the MSN, MSM like. Uh, media outlets have been tr- M- telling you. I call it MSDNC now. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's been that way for a while. And then you yeah. have anyone that like uh, it, it's it's why we're so uh, upset at that you know not so youthful Turkish media group um, that you know they had potential, tons yeah. of it. Yeah. Right. Well, I just I think everyone needs to understand that like it's not what we have now is a media system where like Fox News basically carries water for Donald Trump and the GOP. Yes. You have MSNBC and CNN, which carry water for, you know, Obama and Hillary and the DNC. And then you have the Young Turks who basically carry water for AOC and the squad. And it's not the yeah. job of any media person to carry water for politicians. The job no. of the media is to hold politicians accountable. And so, but again, the, the squad, because they were fighting, originally they ran on the right issues, they fought for the right issues. But the problem is, is we nobody could hold them accountable. And when we tried to hold them accountable last year, we were sworn at, we were, we were told when we I were think- traitors. I was called a traitor. I was called oh, a yeah. I was uh, we've been called I, everything. I was called every name in the book. And all I was yep. doing was, why can't AOC use her platform that the people gave her? And why can't the squad, all of them, use it to challenge the corrupt establishment, hold Pelosi's feet to the fire, and demand a vote on Medicare for all? Because sunlight is really the great disinfectant. And until yep. you bring Medicare for all to a vote, or until you bring any of these popular policies to a vote, you can't expose the Democrats who are corrupted by corporate money until they actually are forced to vote for it. Like well, that will literally help it's us. It's a so possibility. Much. Like, people are like, oh, but if you bring it to a vote and it fails, that yeah. will set the movement back. No, it won't. No. Because then we know exactly who's corrupt. It's in record. These people voted down Medicare for all during a pandemic and we primary all of them. We couldn't right. even get that out of AOC and the squad. So no. like, it's forget about it. Anyways. They have um, no strategy. I, you know. This has been great, Reef. Uh, yes, I, could talk, I could talk with you for hours. I, me too, man. Maybe you should come on sometime or I'll come on one of your shows we'll do. sometime. We'll Definitely. Do. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, right, appreciate have a good it. One, man. Keep doing the good work. Definitely. Uh, Rob, why don't you give us a little closing today? 